ติสังขโตธรรมานังวิจโยตัทามวิโรยัมปิสัมกัมจะตัทาปเรสมาทุเพกะพุทธังกาสังเกตุเสปะทัสสินาโอนิยามะทัสสินาตามโอเค welcome so as Charles said this is the the last of the Bojanga series on Upeka. And the, the day for the paper is Sunday. So let's have a look at the, the Buddha Rupas that uh, are used for this. Sunday. So the Buddha Rupa for Upeka, um, the Sunday Rupa is this one. Mostly you see this in connection with the days of the week, Buddha Rupas. But this one I've seen a couple of occasions on its own, um, not in connection with the, the whole group of seven. So it's a little bit uh, atypical in that sense, because some of them are, are very specific to the, to the days of the week tradition. So this one is, um, it's solid. Bronze, it's actually quite heavy, even though it's not terribly, terribly big. Um, and it's in this interesting posture with the, the hands in front, held in that position with the eyes open. Standing Buddha Rupa with the eyes open in this particular posture. And the, the story behind this is it connects back to the second week after the Buddha's enlightenment, when after sitting under the Bodhi tree for seven days, he stood, moved some distance away, and turned and gazed at the uh, Bodhi tree, the place where he attained um, enlightenment, for another seven days. And he said that this was done with unwavering gaze, eyes open, never blinking. So the, the Rupa tries to convey this by the, the eyes open. This particular one, the, uh, the eyes are made up of mother of pearl and uh, a, a dark stone, which I suspect is probably onyx. Um, it could be on some of the older ones, it was tectite, but I think this is probably not that old. This was um, in my wife's family for a hundred years, so I don't know the exact age before that. And it used to be gilded, there's traces of gilding in the folds of the robe. This is a more modern one, a temple in Ayutthaya. And I don't think this is making a statement of being the uh, Sunday Buddha Rupa or the Buddha Rupa of Bojanga because it's placed in a, in a very important position in the temple. So I, I, for whatever reason, I don't know the history, it's history. It's taking, taking a kind of key position um, in this temple and it's given respect to its own right, I think quite apart from the day of the week tradition. So before these talks, I haven't actually given very much thought to this day of the week, Buddha Rupa tradition. But as we've been going through them, I'm just struck by the way the, the story behind the Rupa, plus the, the nature of the posture, the mudra, um, the form of the Rupa, both together say something which we may not have realised about the about mm -hmm. particular culture. It's a very interesting tradition which seems to have been mostly lost. Um, so in this case, if you look at the form of the Rupa, what strikes me is the, first of all, the overall posture. It's standing, it's erect, it's quite strong, 
the position, but it looks strong but relaxed. And the hands in this particular pose are interesting. They're not trying to do anything. Um, they're not making a point of like some of the other standing groupers do. And the whole impression is that this, this is a, a posture, an image of composure. That's the word that com comes to my mind. And checking it in the um, in online dictionary definition, composure means calm, tranquil, free from disturbance or agitation, which seems very appropriate to Opeka. Also, it strikes me that standing erect is a very human characteristic that's evolved for human beings. So maybe also it's making the point in this case, this composure, this standing, gazing and blinking, is a human being who has attained enlightenment. It's a man in this case. The second thing that um, I think is very intriguing is the statement in various ways in the text that the Buddha gazed for seven days, unblinking, unwavering stare, gaze, um, with eyes open. Now, this intrigues me because blinking is something that came up in the EEG study. I mean, I'd always, like most people, understood blinking to be a kind of function to keep the um, eyes, the cornea, moistened. But actually, the, the nature of blinking is very tied up to cognitive processing. So in the, in the last talk, when we were talking last week about samadhi, I mentioned the heart rate and heart rate variability as a clue to what's going on in the body in samadhi. And if you remember, there's a cor correlation between heart rate variability and the balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And so you can get an idea from heart rate variability, just how, um, com just how peaceful and integrated and undisturbed the body becomes in Samadhi. Now with the eye blinks, to my surprise when I looked into this, there's a kind of little known study of, heart, of eye blinks, both the intensity and the blink rate variability, which I, I was completely new to me until um, I started the EG study. And the two, the intensity of the blink and the blink rate variability related to the intensity of cognitive processing and the complexity of cognitive processing. And that if you give a person a task, a cognitive task, you can see the effect on, on eye blinks. And in the EEG, for meditation, meditators or anyone, eye blinks are very easily seen because every time our eye blinks, there's a muscle spasm which sends a tiny electrical charge to the electrodes at the front of the head. And so on the EEG trace, you see these spikes coming up every time someone blinks. And interestingly, even with the eyes closed, the process still goes on in a slightly damped way because the eye eyelid is closed but you can still see blinks and when a meditator starts practice the eye blinks are nearly always there in fact some for some people because the experience of being recorded is new causes a little bit of um, um, getting used to apprehension maybe the eye, eye blinks may be very strong but as the person gets into meditation gets through the initial stages the intensity fades and then they quieten down until once a person gets past a certain threshold they disappear so maybe you know this particular feature is like an intuitive understanding that the eyes open unblinking is related to a completely undisturbed uh, mental state and bodily brain state where everything is peaceful no blinking. I'm not suggesting you, you try it. I mean, it may, it may be not very good for um, uh, keeping your eyes hydrated. Uh, so in the, in the first talk in this series, I made a comment that from the very first steps we take to establish sati, mindfulness, the really simple, very first steps 
um, giving attention to the number in the counting in Anapanasati, that as soon as we take that first step, which is, is actually a mental act, it's a kind of specific, clear mental act of placing the attention somewhere, in this case on the, on the number, that as soon as we take that step, at some level, we establish a process and the potential completion of that process. I don't know whether you, you thought about this or what you make of that statement, um, but I think it's a, sta it's a kind of idea that you can recognize on, on many different levels. The one in meditation is, is quite subtle, um, but on other levels it's obvious. I mean, the most obvious is birth and death. But as soon as um, you're born, then there's a death going to come in the future. You can't keep the two separate. There's no, there's no, there's no death without birth. And in most Buddhist traditions, the reverse, the, the opposite. <coughs> so that's one obvious level. On a very kind of strange practical level, um, I remember. For myself in the in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, I used to make a lot of long haul flights, and not infrequently I would have a rather strange dissociative uh, experience. I might be going up the boarding steps for a plane at the outset, and at the same time I was going up the stairs to leave London. I'd be also simultaneously going up the stairs on a flight two weeks and two weeks later in either Bangkok or <coughs> India for the return flight. And when it first started to happen, I was quite um, intrigued by this because it was so vivid. The, the boarding the flight in London, the parallel boarding the flight in Bangkok was so real that the, the whole scene, scent, smells, was very clear. You know, if you've ever been to Bangkok or India, and you get off the plane at the airport, you'll be set by vivid smells, you know, um, decay, humidity, diesel fuel, aviation fuel, there may be um, barbecue chicken, um, the whole mix of scents which you, you actually never never quite forget so that kind of dissociation was not every trip but more often than not <laughs> i used to experience now, i don't want to overanalyze it but i think it's an example that sometimes in very very different situations to meditation something about the dissociation from time and space or the beginning and ending the whole time sequence can shift and I suspect this gets clearer the further in meditation we go, and I think it also gets clearer the older you get. Um, the, older, the older that I get, I notice that um, I feel less anchored in time and space. Um, I sometimes vividly recollect things from 50, 60 years ago, even 70 years ago, which I might not have thought about before, and start to understand that everything is somehow connected in the end and nothing is wasted. But then on another level in meditation, when you sit at the end of a practice like we've been doing, and I ask you to stay with the stillness, and that, that stillness tells you something about where you've been, without thinking, without kind of verbally trying to work it out. You just come to know something, what journey you've been experiencing, and you may be able to clearly understand the preceding genres or the stages that led you to that point. And so, looking at the form of the, the Buddha-rupa for Upeka, what comes to mind in that case is that the Buddha has completed his path. 
nothing left to, to do. And he's gazing at the place where that process came to completion. And my imagination goes towards something similar, but on a much more profound scale to what we do staying with the stillness at the end of the practice of understanding everything that's gone before. And that in this sense, Upeka is not just stillness and a calm, peaceful feeling or equanimity. It, it becomes far more than that. Maybe another synonym for enlightenment, actually. So we use the word Upeka not samadhi, not even tranquility, in this context where it's standing for the ending of the path, or baker. This is all that's gone before during these talks. I showed a similar diagram right at the beginning, um, but this is sort of reorganized a little bit to show a bit more clearly how the bojangas in this column here relate to the Rupajana, the first Rupajana, the second Rupajana, the third Rupajana, the fourth Rupajana. Right at the beginning here is the nice, beautifully simple way Nai Bhumlan taught originally, where he taught nearly only about mindfulness and concentration. What you know about jhana and hearing Nai Bhumlan talk about it didn't really start until the early 2000s. And at the end here, I've also put in the factors of the Eightfold Path. Um, I'm not going to say much about this because the Eightfold Path is, is not exactly the same kind of purpose behind the structure that the Bhujangas and the Jhanas have. It's, it's also, in addition, it's very also related to how we live. So you can, you can make sense of this yourself understand more about what you think these different factors of the Eightfold Path are to do with living in the world as well as meditation. So the starting point we had at the beginning was um, de developing mindfulness and Dhammavichaya and that was all to do with redirecting attention to the meditation object of the breath and in doing that, the first two jhana factors, Pitaka and Vichara, develop. And the brain study, if you remember, shows a very, very clear relation between Vitaka and Vichara and the two attention networks in the brain, when we should disrupt it, when we start to practice Sati and Dhamma Vichaya. So, in the first Rupa Jhana, the real task is to master the Taka Vichara, to understand the Taka Vichara until it comes to the point of being more or less automatic. We don't have to constantly catch our attention, wandering and bringing it back. It becomes a felt state, which is just almost automatic, like riding a bike. So the first Rupajana, Pitaka and Vichara, in a way, define the first Rupa Jhana. And when they're completed, when the first Rupa Jhana becomes more or less complete, then they also signal that we have, at least temporarily, disengaged from thinking, discrimination, naming, those qualities of sensory consciousness. And we are experiencing the beginnings of Jhana consciousness, uh, in fact, when it comes to the one-pointedness in this state, you can say this is jhana. But the other factors, PT and sukha, are not yet powerful. They're not yet fully developed. I put a kagata down here because it's a very confusing word. I don't use it much, and I'm never quite sure what I mean by it or what other people mean by it. But certainly, even in the first group of jhana, the moments of completion, where everything comes together is a kind of one point in this, a kind of samadhi, but not the same kind of samadhi as in the third and fourth Rupa Jhana. 
so we come to the point in the understanding Vitaka and Vichara where they become more or less automatic. They don't disappear, but they become almost like the, the kind of foundations of a new dwelling place, like the foundations of the, um, the wood I used early on from the, from the um, formula for the first root Vichara. We establish a new Vihara, a new dwelling place. And so Vitaka and Vichara become the kind of foundations of everything that follows. Deep, deep down, by the time you get to the third and fourth root Vichara, you don't have to worry about your foundations or examine them. You can take them and trust them. So when the first root Vichara comes to completion and they're established, they become foundations, I put them in brackets. They're still there latently. And the main factor now is pity. Because what has happened is, once attention is Sati and Dhamma Vichaya are strong enough, and we've more or less started to feel what it means to separate from sensory consciousness, the feeling of contentment, not needing to be anywhere else or do anything to go anywhere, then the next three Vichangas, Niriya, Piti, Asadi, are free to develop. And the purpose of the second Rupa Jhana is to work with, with those factors, particularly PT, until at the completion of the second Rupa Jhana, they are progressively, they come to be integrated and harmonized into the experience of the meditation. They, they in turn, PT becomes part of the foundation in the third Rupa Jhana. So now in the third Rupishana, Vitaka, Vikshara, Piti are your supports. But the main factor in the third Rupishana is with no more bodily disturbance, which actually is, is related to thinking and discrimination. Thinking is in, in many ways a bodily function. With Piti becoming incorporated, what's left is a deep, deep, feeling of peace and satisfaction, sukha. And the experience of the third Rupa Jhana is often described as the meditator feeling absolutely fully conscious, maybe for the first time, if this is a new experience, and then gradually it may become familiar. Fully conscious means there's no doubt in the meditator's experience that there's anything left out. There's nothing lurking as a kind of half-formed thought or a, a slightly potential distraction. It's so, so strongly on the level of the mind itself that the meditator knows nothing is left out. And if you remember showing the EEG record, literally in the brain activity, everything is slowed down, it's focused on a vertical axis and there is no longer any of the networks that support the ordinary sensory consciousness. So the two factors that we are to deep, deep satisfaction and happiness. And the sense that of being fully conscious that nothing is left out, samadhi, we can use now in the third group genre. It wouldn't be appropriate for the second or first, which is why I put down the kangata as a kind of precursor. So the progress for a meditator in the third Rupa Jhana, those two factors, it develops progressively so that as you get more familiar with it, as a meditator negotiates understanding Sukha and Samadhi, in a, in a kind of automatic way, even Sukha becomes a subtle disturbance. To the samadhi. And finally, the meditator feels clear enough to simply rest in samadhi. There's no longer any need for feeling. I mean, sukha is a very pleasant, blissful feeling. But what it really means at the completion of the third group of jhana is that there is no longer dependence on, on that kind of satisfaction. It's enough to be completely, perfectly balanced in samadhi. 
and at that point a fourth group of drama emerges and Sukkah becomes part of the foundation for that and what's left is is Upeka you could say Samadhi but it's is now so refined and free of dependence on feeling that the baker is used. It can't go any higher in terms of balance than that. It's also said that each of the jhanas has its own perfection, which is what I'm trying to convey by describing the process of becoming familiar and understanding the jhana factors, the Takabhikshana first, PT, Sukha and Samadhi, and Upeka. And it's said in the oral tradition, I have not seen anything written down on this, that the perfection of each of the jhanas corresponds to a temporary experience of the four paths the four paths that constitute realization. Sotapana, stream entry, Sakatagamin, once returner, Anagamin, non-return, and Arahat, everything completed. That's along the lines of everything that's gone before in these series of talks. And it's also along the lines of everything that, that's gone before in meditation for anyone. You know, when you sit down for each practice, there's a history of everything, everything that's gone before. And this kind of um, way we've been talking about it on the Bhujangas and the structures, the structures of the Bhujangas, the structures, structures that underpin the jhanas, um, is one way of kind of formulating a direction. Um, the starting point. And then you have the challenge when you actually sit to put all that to one side so that it's not a hindrance. And in the in the kind of um, way people adapt themselves or are turned to meditation, there are two very very broad character types. Some people find it really, really helpful to think of structures like this. Before they practice, it gives a starting point. Whereas another group of meditators find it a, a real hindrance. So the, the first group get great satisfaction, rather like hearing a Dhamma talk in capacity, from reading, from studying these structures, and it allows them to get into the trust their meditation. Another person, if it doesn't work like that, Another person, if they're trying to do it that way, might find it, it just very, very, disturb, very not disturbing, but very um, a hindrance. They much prefer to dive in and find their own way, learn how to swim, which can be a bit risky. And eventually it works and both modes come together. And finally, both character types, both, everyone comes to work with both qualities. It's, it's in, in a way connected to the uh, two um, categories of Samatha and Vipassana. They start to function together. I think in the, I'm not sure whether it was actually Shah in Thailand, but one of the teachers described it as for the first character type, it's um, <coughs> Vipassana leads Samatha. And for the second character type, the Samatha leads to Pasana. So, as a kind of balance for this very detailed way of looking at things, um, I was thinking of the, if we happen to be in lockdown, this weekend will be the first weekend of a Yoga Vachara retreat which some of you would have been on, and I would have been on. So that kind of prompts me to, to, to show you a completely different approach to structure, um, to try and just balance things out a little bit at the end of these talks. 
So in the yoga Vichara tradition, they rather than conventional language, a kind of twilight language emerged based on syllables, often in the Cambodian script or the Mon script in Thailand. Um, and diagrams like this one, Yantra, which are um, a way of, a bit like the days of the week with us, a way of conveying some meaning. So there are lots and lots of Yantras. And this is one of a class of Yantra called uh, Yang On Pra, On is Body. So it's a Yantra of the body of Buddha. If you want to know more about the Yoga Vichara, that's the website where you can find more information. So this is, this is, this is an example of uh, a non pra yantra. <coughs> so what happens is when you're drawing a yantra, the aim is to do it in one fluid, uninterrupted movement. You may want to try it yourself with this one. It's a nice one to start with. And it's deceptively tricky, you will find. So this first attempt here, you know, it's a little bit like the first attempt to develop sati. Um, not sure what's happened there. Oh, there we are. I don't know whether you saw that, but somehow the screen was interrupted by somebody from another another realm. <laughs> um, yeah, the process of drawing it mirrors the process of developing meditation. There has to be mindfulness, there has to be some degree of Dhamma Vichaya, but also as you're doing it with these on Prayan, you are also dealing with the body. And if you practice this, you might find yourself not exactly holding your breath, but to keep the mindfulness steady, probably doing the whole thing on an out breath. And then in the tradition, these are often linked to certain uh, syllables. And for this kind of yantra, <coughs> the, the syllables are nearly always these three ma, a, u. Ma stands for the foundation that's the cambodian character for man it's related to the mother as the ultimate foundation from where we come from and you know some of you know who've been a monk that the, when you ordain as a monk they are often your mother will be the person who offers you a bowl the monk's bowl almost like a symbolic womb but a different womb to your mother's womb that you came from and becoming a monk is a, is a new life with, uh, to some extent, a different language. But in the, the Yoga Vichara, it's never forgotten. And the, the importance of the mother as a foundation is, is paramount. So that usually goes down here. The second is A. Ah. A ah is a very short sound at the back of the throat. It's the shortest vowel. And the, the, the way a ah is used in this kind of tradition is that it's so short, it cuts. It, it brings a change of lineage. In Pali, if you put a ah in front of a word, it, the word disappears. So a ah rupa is, rupa disappears. It becomes formless. Or anatta, atta self disappears into non self, anatta. And in the structure here, it symbolizes that moment where the meditator undergoes a kind of transition point in their meditation, which we talked about as completion of separating from sensory consciousness into jhana consciousness. And the third syllable, U, is 
in Pali words, it also has a meaning when it comes at the beginning of the word to indicate something higher or moving upwards, like uh, in the parameters, the perfections. Upa parami is a higher par parameter, a higher perfection, not just a perfection, but something higher. Upa parami. In a monk's ordination, Upa Sampada is the second higher ordination. When a monk becomes 21, he takes a higher ordination if he's been a novice before. So Upa indicates something higher. So in this Yogavachara tradition, there's a foundation you establish. Everything that's gone before when you come to sit, that week, that year, the number of years in your life, everything that's gone before, you sit in this petition, in, in this with it there in, implicitly. You come to a point in meditation as you go deeper where something shifts towards understanding what jhana might be, which emerges, and then everything is now free in this direction. So when you draw these yantras, you're never going to get it right. I don't know anyone who can draw a, a beautiful yantra um, the first time or even the, the even the hundredth time. And so when you sit in meditation, the parallel is you're not going to get it right. For a long time or maybe to some degree ever. At least in, in the context of the fourth root pajama. But every time you sit, you, you go through this process of like working through the stages. And in the Yoga Vachara, it's seen as developing a, a, a different kind of body, a, a Dhammakaya, a body of Dhamma, a subtle body, or in Rupajana terms, a body, a fine material body. No longer just the coarse um, body we know from biology, etc. Someone last week in the discussion after the practice commented that um, her experience of coming out of that practice was to realize that the experience of the body was actually quite strange. Um, not not quite the same shape and limitations of the body she knew she had. And so the sense of time, space, and body changes. Each time you sit, you go a little bit further. And further. Gradually, you're learning by doing, by feeling, what this means, this means in terms of samadhi integration of body-mind. And so finally, you get a sense of what lies behind this. And then that becomes integrated into the kind of form of stillness. And so on. But in the stillness, when you come out of meditation, everything is implicit of where you where you've come from. Even in the most profound stillness, everything is somehow there, where you, where what you've experienced, where you come from. And when you stay with the stillness, the whole process can can become clear. right back to the to the first steps so that's where we've come to and really nothing much else to say and when you look at your practice you know, each day you may be um, you may come to realize when you stay with the stillness that 
actually you understand a lot more than you might have realized. So we'll practice for, um, as we do usually for about 20 minutes. And then at the end of the practice, um, stay with the stillness. And as we all see what, if anything comes to mind, maybe nothing will come to mind. So I sound the bell at the beginning of the practice and at the end of the practice. Um, follow your own practice. Follow the stillness. See where it leads you. In that, in in this, um, the verses in in the suttas about the monk sitting cross-legged, bottom of a tree, base of a tree, and um, secluded from the world, <clears throat> and um, that kept coming up uh, uh, while I was sitting here. Felt very secluded. I could hear things going on uh, outside the room, but. Um, they were sort of, uh, I can't explain how they were, but that, that mm. was the word. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, there was a sort of sense of being quite strong. There's a very sort of strong feeling that comes in the practice, um, like a, a core of strength or something something like that. Paul, I was interested in what you said about time sequences, boarding the plane and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a theme which uh, is present in some, let's say, important places like the first, the beginning of the Sefer Yetzirah, for instance, and also in T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. And uh, interestingly, I don't know if you've seen the uh, film about the uh, conductor Celibidash, which is called Celibidash's Garden. And in that film, first there seems to be a link with Buddhism, which is left unexplained because he has Buddhist monks in his garden from time to time, but that's beside the way for the moment. There's a point where he talks about uh, his conducting of a piece, and he talked about some um, one years ago when he read, and he actually had the experience of feeling the end of the of the uh, piece of music as the beginning began, so to speak, of really sensing the end in the beginning. Um, I think it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting topic. Um, yes, what, what came up for me quite a lot is the, the ma a u um, and how it, how it seems to relate to practice. Um, I guess it, it, it partly actually in relation to centres and, and what we're like, obviously, as the diagram suggests, three main centres. Um, and with the ma, in particular, it, it, it feels so important that there's that sense of, I suppose, being contained, held, all, all those sorts of sense of being in a place one can almost work from and let go from um, as sort of quite core and basic to everything else that happens in the practice. So it feels like a lot of practice is sort of working from that place and that position, going from it and back to it, almost in a sort of a, a rhythm. So, so that's one of the things that was sort of prompted in particular by, by that sense of ma'a'u. Um, also, actually, I think in relation to Rupa and Arupa, and that it, it struck me that listening to the talk was that the sense of structure and working without structure does feel like it relates very much to Rupa and Arupa. Yeah. So the sense of yeah. 
what actually it's like to let go. You know, the, the, our Rupa feels very much like exploring mm -hmm. the limits of Rupa and the limits of how one works with and lets go of Rupa. So that, that was one of the things sort of prompted by the talk. From the talk and picking up the other uh, points people were making, I realized that um, for quite some time with my group, um, I made a particular point of having um, what I called a, a lingering at the end of the practice, that the transition from the sitting practice um, to, to the end of it would uh, I made more, much more of it um, and invited the group on a, a sort of regular basis. It was part of the practice to not uh, move um, uh, and quietly sit uh, before opening their eyes. And then when they did open their eyes to allow them to rest on anything within the room that, that seemed to call their attention, and then and, and stay with that uh, for a while and just appreciate what it was they were looking at or noticing with their senses. And, um, and then very gently kind of allowing that to happen and then sharing uh, some of the experiences. And um, I realized that I did that as a proper ending and it was more a sort of gentle transition, but I think as we did it, there was more to it. Um, and particularly you said, I think last week and this about the stillness um, at the end uh, and, and within that, um, th there's some kind of insight, I suppose. And it did feel like that, that even as they spoke of the, the greenness of the, you know, the leaf or something that they noticed, it, it did seem to awaken a deeper understanding yes. but it was a very simple thing to do you know so I'm glad we did that you know but we, we just did it of our, our own accord but I think it's a vital part of the practice absolutely I agree and that's your instinct as a, as a group it comes out of the instinct of the group to follow that line yes 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 this is very you know this is the kind of it's like a kind of supple I called it twilight language, but it's not that anyone tells you to do that. But there's something in the connection, you know, to the past ultimately, that will will have its say. It's almost like the you know the wind whispers it to you, or or the colour of green that you mentioned whispers it to you. It's like it's like a twilight language. <laughs> you don't know where you heard it. But you understand something, you know what to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There we go. Yes, I've got, I've got a question about equanimity. Um, I'm, I'm curious about it because it feels to me as though the equanimity in the jhana practice is slightly different to the equanimity um, in the Brahmi Viharas. And I don't know whether that's imagination or whether they're that I'm just curious about whether that's um, that's something interesting to explore or or not. Do you mean the equanimity as you develop the Brahma Viharas throughout the sequence to a Mm, Yes. You come to a different experience of a Faker than you would in Jhana. Yes. How how different? Well, that's what I'm, I can't say really. It's, mm. it's more like a, a flavour, you know, if, you, you, yeah. if you've got a curry and you're not quite sure what the spice is, if you know what I mean. It's, it, just, um, it just feels slightly different to me, but I don't know whether that's imagination. No, I think when you pick up something subtle like that and you can't quite put your finger on pin it down and gradually if you, if you don't rush it, then some more understanding will come at some point. I suspect something to do with feeling, 
as, as you're making sense of the progression through the Brihana Viharas has something to do with what feeling means to you. Mm. And that may be a slightly different process to when you try and do it through the, through the jhanas. I'm not sure that's all that comes to mind. Right. I'll explore. Earlier, that I remember having been in the um, Shrine Hall in Manchester on some occasions. Uh, um, right in the middle of the practice, my eyes would just pop open. Um, and I just it would feel like, a, like the statue <laughs> you showed. Um, and I would be there in the hall, in the quiet, in, in the spaciousness of it, mm. very still. And that, 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 that memory of um, that happening several times came up. Mm. And it's an interesting example of how we, we, interesting, important things we never forget. <laughs> and they're nearly always connected. Well, they're all. They are always connected to feeling, mm. feeling memories. And sometimes you recollect something like that. You know, in the same way that uh, uh, in the story of the Buddha's life, he he practiced with all the um, the great, well-known teachers of his day, and realized that that he still hadn't found the way. And recollected sitting down, recollected an experience he had as a, as a boy um, of watching his mm. father manage the plowing ceremony and then drifting into uh, recollection of the stillness of the first Rupagana. And realizing this time, at that point, later than the experience when he was a child, what it could potentially lead to. Is, is my understanding, because from that point on, mm. that became the main focus of the, of the development of the path through the jhanas uh, and the entire development. So things, we, we sometimes remember things you know from 50, 60 years before, which you never really understood what the significance was at the time, but it's never lost and wasted, it's a very interesting process. I remember, for example, someone talking about the sense of time in a film or whatever. The beginning and the end being known. And I remember Nai Bullman once asking a group in the early, very early years, I'm talking about the 60s, probably, um, it must have been 65 or 66 in one of the Cambridge classes, asking the group who had, they would have completed the um, 16 stages. And he asked them, um, um, I wonder whether if you knew where your practice was be, would, it, would go, if you, if you knew what it would lead you to, would you ever start. And then after a little while he, he added something more because clearly people were puzzled. Something like if you, you, you may come to a point where you know that to go further beyond this point there'd be no going back. And You've no certainty if what going forward means until you go forward. But you do know that if you go forward past this point, you can't go back. Would you start? And that memory popped to my mind when someone was talking earlier today. Very important seeds that when you're teaching, if you're taking a group yourself, sometimes you never know the impact of something you might say in a in a, a fairly ad hoc way it might mean a lot to someone in the group. Quite a quite a, a beautiful process actually.
Um, what came to mind, like Paul um, had said about, um, Paul Becker said about, the, I found that yantra really, really helpful. And linking it in when you said about the jhanas with the four paths. And in the practice, what came to mind really strongly was almost like a sense of choice. And what you just said then about Naibuman's comment, would you carry on? It's almost like you're at this threshold, um, a threshold of knowing whether you're going to stay caught up in stuff. And it really, I really thought about the, um, the third path of the non-returner and it being linked to third jhana. And there was just something about that, that having to be almost convinced or just that residue or something that holds you back. And also what came to mind was that fact of how often we play to an audience, even in the practice, you know, how we think it's going or um or what we'd report or what you know like that that sense of feeding something in us and when you go beyond that point you're not that's no longer relevant mm. that's how it felt mm. Mm. yeah in the end you have to face face that yourself mm. but it's very important the what's preceded it and the, the really important part is the is the connection to the path, and so if that's there, it'll it'll eventually see you through that transition point, through either your teacher or the lineage or whatever. You know, in the in the, in the yantra that I drew, the the foundation, the ma, is what I talked about earlier in these talks in the yoga vichara as calling on the lineage. Um, so everything that goes, has gone before is not just your practice in in um, your adult life here. It, it goes back to your teacher, his practice, his teacher's practice, back, back, back to the the main teachers following the Buddha, then the Buddha. It, it goes back to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, all the way through that. Then in this life, it also includes our mother. Very important. Mm -hmm. Because that's where this physical body comes from. So the map is everything that's gone before, and because it's authentically connected in that way, at some level, at some point, you will know that you can trust that connection. Thank you. I I um found the the. Uh, the drawing of the yantra sort of over and over again quite strangely compelling and um, I didn't try and do anything with it in the practice but I kind of realized that it it, it sort of sub subtly informed it it was like having a loose structure of the practice at the back of my mind but not fixing to it just sort of knowing which length I was in and allowing myself to move as it, as it felt right and not worrying about anything being too perfect. And I, I didn't realize that what I was doing, but it kind of became clear. And um, stillness would kind of um, come into a kind of, not focus, stillness would sort of become apparent and that kind of nimitta would become apparent and then the breath would change. And the whole body would just adjust to that breath and be nourished by it and then then it would just kind of go and then it would just return and it was um quite uh um an interesting way to practice i found it quite quite helpful it was kind of um was a, a thread from last week similar not not just allowing everything to come into the mix but having that that structure in the background and not fixing of the practice but not fixing to it and just sort of like trusting trusting something mm. quite useful yeah if you consider it useful at this point could you explain uh, a little about what you understand a 
body witnesses in terms of meditation practice? Um, well, it's a, it's a kind of evocative phrase, isn't it? That, come, that comes up in some of the um, some of the like the Vista de Magro and the Muti Maga. <coughs> um, I can only say what the, my associations to it are because I, I've no idea about the um, the kind of academic view or the or the commentarial view or the you know the, the what what else is there in the books or what is meant on that kind of level, but on a kind of pure experiential basis, certain certain things come to mind. You, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, the main thing that comes to mind is the nature of samadhi in jhana. And the kind of quality of consciousness, of jhana consciousness, that is something that you can't predict you would understand until you experience it. And then you experience the, the experience of being just fully present, whereas in normal everyday consciousness, there's a subject and an object, and we're always conscious of something. And yet in jhana consciousness, at first sight, it appears to be that we're not conscious of a specific thing. But then you you let it kind of um, um, mature, um, get a little bit more familiar with it. What is the nature of consciousness in jhana? Because there has to be conscious of something. And there are two possibilities that occur to me, and I'm not sure whether these occur to me purely from my own practice or whether they're influenced by things I've read, uh, little bits of both, I think, I think bits of both as usual, as the usual case. So the, the two things are, are this, that the first is that the, the time scale in, in jhana is so slow that the experience is very, very different to um, sensory consciousness. You know, the time scale is, is about a hundred times slower at least. So it appears almost to be timeless. And so what does that mean then? That is there a, a subtle subject object aware of the experience of jhana? And if it's so so you know, if the samadhi is so steady and so peaceful and steady and undisturbed, what maybe it's something to do with as that like a person in jhana, there's a sort of very, very fast um, flicker. And very, very gentle or my, very tiny flicker that allows us to be aware of, 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 of the consciousness itself. In which case, one moment of consciousness becomes the object of the next. And this could appear as perfectly continuous because if you look at if you look at the EEG there are only two things I can find one this is from the third group of genre on one is the um, the vertical axis <coughs> taking up sometimes 97 98 percent of the energy in the brain the activity in the brain very very slow no more thinking frequencies of sensory consciousness but there is a very, very weak background, what's called gamma activity, which is very fast. Very, very fast. Um, things like 50 to 100 or more cycles per second. And no one really understands gamma, whether it's a kind of very subtle flicker where uh, it, it's like a moment of awareness of where we are, but so brief it doesn't interfere with the stillness. That's one possibility. They haven't got to answering your point yet, Chris. But the other, the other is that the, the sensation of being embodied. 
is also very characteristic. That it's not that we're aware of a part of the body, but it's just that we are embodied. And so it's not in the head and the body has disappeared. But in fact, the separation it doesn't mean the same. It's like um, someone earlier on was talking about the new, uh, new sense of containment and safety, like a new dwelling in jhana, mm. which is the word viharati, you know, in the formula for the uh, first rupa jhana. The new vihara, like uh, the same word used for um, a monastic dwelling for a monk or a nun. The new vihara. And part of it is appears that it's a kind of complete samadhi of body and mind and brain, the whole lot, nothing is left out. And that made me think of the, of the word body witness. As to whether the, the some reciprocal relationship between the two systems, the bodily system and the mind or brain system, um, that we're aware of the consciousness or the experience somehow through the body. Now, I know this sounds quite concrete to bring this back to a kind of neurological factor. Um, and it may seem a little bit getting away from the, the meditation or the Buddhist point. But if I can just reconnect to a picture I showed you in one of the earlier talks. This is a picture I showed, um, I'm not quite sure which talk it was, but it's a, it's a combination of what goes on in the brain in when this vertical axis is developed. Very highly connected area, all the frontal, all the other networks are, are quietened down. But this area is connected right through the core of the brain, into the brainstem, into the vagus system, the nervous system of the body, the whole, the whole tree-like structure of the nerves in the body that manage the heart, the lungs, the digestion, everything. Now, mostly in the last 20 years in neuroscience, it's been thought that the, the seat of consciousness must lie somewhere in the cortex, which is like the thin, convoluted layer of the brain. But what we find in jhana is that all those activities fade and you're left with this extremely simple activity at the top going into the body. Now, it's turned out in very recently, recent research, that the, the area at the top of the brainstem is almost like a, a key gateway between the body systems and the cortical systems. You've got neurons in the brain and you've got um, different kind of entities in the nervous system but it all has to interconnect. And the research comes up trying to understand what happens when you drop into deep sleep. How is it that the, the normal kind of awareness and consciousness disappears in the body? Where in meditation it doesn't. But there may be something about this gateway here where the, the embodied bit, it's almost like the body is aware of what's going on at some level. And I wonder whether the, the phrase body witness is almost like a subjective experience of that when we feel, when we're developing from the second Rupa Jhana on, we feel this developing sense to be embodied. So that doesn't really answer your question in the way you're thinking, Chris, but it, it's all that comes to my mind. Paul, is there an objective reality there for? We seem to be still bringing the neurological stuff in and and we're having our subjective experience and so is there an objective reality i think they're all part of the same thing just different bits of information we have to make up the big the bigger picture so we live within a body you know we we have a brain then we have this strange thing we call a mind um we don't fully understand exactly what what that really means objectively but the fact is we live within this whole complex system 
So in that sense, I don't think you can kind of ignore. There may be some very useful information from the from the kind of objective scientific reality, um, which is yes, I find quite helpful. Um, and what about a shared objective reality between a group within a group? Oh yeah, absolutely. What are you thinking of? Well, maybe when you have shared experiences in a meditation practice, for example, or knowings that seem to come at the same time, or and thinking back to that time aspect you were talking about before, and that sense of all time being here at one point. I think it's a really important um, kind of consideration about the value, what goes on in, in a group. And looking at the last sort of 50, 50 years or so, of how Samatha has developed. Personally, I think quite a lot of people, I certainly have noticed more and more, you know, as the years pass, how, how important and powerful the group experience is. So that it's really, really clear now that when you sit in a group of experienced meditators and less experienced meditators, a kind of mixed group, that the, um, the group as a whole has a life which can take you further than you could as an individual. Um, and I'm including the most experienced people in that group too. You know, things come up out of the group which um, are sometimes really profound that you, you, you would maybe not have connected to in your individual practice or for a long time. I suppose you could link it back I mean, if you want to think of it in kind of concrete terms, like the yantra or what I've been talking about, that everything when we sit to practice that's gone before for him, for, for us, uh, is there in the in the background to our practice. But then you have a group of people, all with different what's gone before us in the room. Very different, you know, not not just in terms of you know, detailed meditation experience, but um, emotional connections, family connections, all kinds of influences that are their background to their practice. And I'm sure this is felt at some level, it's somewhere in the mix. And maybe this is what it becomes a collective kind of you know, hitch for that group, which can emerge into quite interesting insights. I mean, if you think about our discussions after sitting during this series of talks, as we've gone along, people got more free to understand the process. Sometimes things have come from one or two people, but it's very clear they resonate with everyone else in the group. Sometimes very deeply, and then that leads to another comment. And then something comes out of the whole thing, not from one individual, not from me, but from the whole group. And that is, that again, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a beautiful process. And I think when you can trust it and see it happening, it takes the, it takes the edge off the, I've got to do something, or I, I'm the one who's, got to perform or be successful at meditation. It kind of brings things much more into a kind of, it normalizes things. You know, in, uh, in psychoanalysis too, I don't do very much, but in group psychoanalysis, where you've got a group and you have a group conductor, a really good group analyst will sit with the group and hardly interfere with the group. And he may know very well what's going on to some degree in the group. Like he may very well recognize that someone has been scapegoated or someone is, is trying to trying to kind of dominate the group or, or that someone else is hiding and not saying anything. But then rather than interpreting that or, or explaining that or trying to explain that to him, sits with it and contains it. Somehow something is felt in the group 
and sooner or later the group as a whole will cotton on and then he moves forward again it's the same thing in that sense there's some similarity oh yeah paul it's uh, going back to the experimental uh, scientific stuff um because you, you're talking about consciousness in the brain uh being in that that, that layer of cells that, that kind of covers the whole brain and then um, with some stuff i've been looking at recently i've been reminded of the left brain right brain uh division and how the two halves one is language um the domain of language and the other one is the domain of rational thinking logical thought and you know there's a incredible kind of crossover <laughs> as well to our eyes and um do do, do um in in meditation uh, uh, with, with uh results of looking at the way different waves that are going on or, or activity do the two halves have exhibit different brain activity and then no. and then the other and then yeah. the other thing was that um, the, the the joining of the two with the corpus callosum, mm. which came up in a conversation I, I uh, with a friend of mine who uh, works in an autistic school because he 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 mentioned it because there'd, there'd been children who had got that joining that cable between the two had been damaged and uh, and it's just come to mind again with. Uh, the nature of some of the discussion today and what you've, you've said well the, the i mean there's a lot of there's a lot you, i could say about the view of the consciousness and the brain what um what came out of the study of meditators it started in a very simple way that study actually it was just purely from personal curiosity but what came out was very interesting in connection with all the previous research on consciousness in the brain. Most of it had been done by, you have a, a group of subjects, and mostly you give them a task. It could be a visual task, it could be a memory task, it could be a feeling-based task. And you monitor the activity in the brain and you try to see which bits light up or which bits quieten down with these different tasks. And they give, an in, they give lots and lots of information. And across a large number of people, you start to realize the front of the head is often connected with a lot of cognitive tasks. Um, certain areas connected with short-term memory, certain areas with long-term memory, but it's incredibly complicated. And all of this is within sensory consciousness. It has to be, if you're giving someone a task, there's a, there's all automatically uh, a subject object language based process going on. This is all sensory consciousness. And so there are massive connections in the brain depending on these different functions. Left and right, you've got, you've got a very kind of crude distinction between thinking and feeling. You've got, as you say, the link to the corpus canis where that gets damaged. But what happens in meditation, at least in this form of meditation, jhana, because it doesn't happen in any other form of meditation, which is more just mindfulness based. <clears throat> in this form of meditation, when someone redirects attention away from sensory consciousness, the brain gets very disrupted and everything becomes disturbed, all the network, all of the attention networks become disrupted and gradually all the activity that you're talking about that comes up in normal mainstream neuroscience research into consciousness in the last 30, 30 years all those networks quieten down become inactive and the jhana consciousness is completely different there is a tendency to be in with that the central line becomes the side activity, most of it fades away, the central line becomes 
remains strong, then the vertex source becomes strong, but that's all that's left. And it's totally different to the conventional consciousness research. So consciousness, like the presence you experience in genre, is, is not at all the subject-object consciousness of all those studies. So I used to believe that it was located somewhere in the cortex. It's not. It can't be, because all those areas are no longer active in jhana meditation. Which is why when, when that paper was published, or well before it was published, it took a year to convince um, reviewers, in the end, very, very experienced reviewers, that this was real. <coughs> and it still hasn't really been digested in terms, in terms of what it's going to mean for understanding consciousness. So there's, there's more, more to emerge. Yeah, there's, hello, there's um, there's a your story about um, the the group of uh, therap the, the therapists with the group uh, has sort of been tapping away at something that, that I've been getting a sense of more and more over the last few years. That is, I think it's probably to do with mindfulness of the body, but where the felt sense overlaps with consciousness because and I, I, it's sort of curious because what came to mind was actually the fine material sphere that actually as um, the exercises you sometimes suggested in the past that we do as well is, and I find it was, you know, the little bit of in the past we had some Thai dancing lessons and I've always found it with Thai dancing movements that they're like little mudra that the detail of the fingers can actually pick something out that the mind can't. And I've also had this, I remember hearing somebody say, well, oh, it takes ages for the knowledge, the body to catch up with the mind. And in reality, I've always found, I thought, actually, I think, for, it, um, sorry, it takes ages for the, uh, yeah, the body to catch up with the mind. But in fact, I found it the other way around sometimes, that my body probably knows things since time immemorial that I've never got in touch with uh, and uh, and all of a sudden oh right you know, that feeling you get with maybe it's something about intuitive knowledge I'm sort of that that feeling you get when uh, you say oh yes that's right that feel, in that common sense sort of thing that we talk about in practice sometimes an like intuitive sort of knowledge that seems to be linked with the body so there's I'm just sort of <coughs> I'm not sure there's a question in it but it's just sort of making me think about that interface between body <laughs> mindfulness <coughs> body knowledge and body consciousness and mm. think about what's mm. going on there in. <laughs> mm. I think I think there's a lot to understand about that and it, it, each, each of us in different ways makes sense of it in our own way I think it, it, it has to be gone through on a personal level and there are, there's a whole range of variations I, I can see in the way people describe it. I mean, even in the discussion just now, there's what you've just said, there's what Kerry was saying about the, uh, what it meant to him thinking about the, on the Yantra, Paul Beck, someone else talking about the sense of um, security and safety in the, in, the, in the new dwelling place of Jhana. These are all, I can, ways of trying to recognize and well not trying to just recognizing the importance of what what the what body carries and i think the i'm not sure whether one comes before or after or catching up but often what happens is we overvalue the, um, the, the thinking the brain we overvalue it in terms of wanting to pin things down into structures into facts and knowledge into words basically but the problem there is as soon as you latch onto one word you're negating a whole range of other words you know if something's red it can't be pink or or gray or yellow and so language and the sort of sensory consciousness in the brain is actually very very crude but the, the body sense is is really very subtle 
seems to me. That example I was talking about with the in the group, anal group analytic situation, group psychoanalysis. Um, when I was working in the NHS, I, I knew quite a few group analysts. And in fact, I did, I did some of the training myself. And what struck me is this capacity to stay with the felt sense and not rush into putting words on it. And most of the really good group analysts that I know who could sit with that and process it and then the group would somehow respond were, were picking up on the really very subtle level of body language, feeling in their own body, which I think you're doing something like Tai Chi or Tai Dancing or Qigong, it gives you all joy, you answer it. You can pick up on that, what, what it basically is what's called in, in Rupa Jhan and the Pantheon. So that level is, 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 is very interesting. It's easily missed. Um, but if you look at the activities in, in Samatha over the last 20 years, there's a, a growing understanding of this. You know, a lot of people are now practicing alongside sitting meditation, becoming aware of, of movement-based practices uh, in conjunction with that, which they found very helpful. I'm just aware, I was puzzled by time, but my, my clock has stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm misreading it. No, anyway. Any more, any more comments? Yes. I've been asking about the group analytical situation. You said the transference and the counter transfer that occurs in the group dynamics that causes, causes this. Say that again. Transference and the counter transference in a group analytical psychotherapy. Yeah. That's the dynamics that will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a different language, really, to what we talk about in in meditation. But it's picking up on the it's picking up on the unconscious connection, the nonverbal, more subtle connection, which includes bodily activity too. If you're in a room with someone in psychoanalysis, then you it's a big part of the information or the communication, which is quite different to the which we call it transference and counter transference. But it's basically the felt unconscious felt connection between two people, not the verbal connection. You feel it and then you understand something more. I know it is quite interesting to see even the conductor in a group with the transference, he could pick up the vibrations from the members. Yeah. And once it affects his, sometimes he identifies himself with the group members and reacts. Yeah. Quite interesting. Yeah, it's very complex, inter intermix. <laughs> he identifies himself with the group member. Mm. And that produces some of his ego coming out and all the <laughs> feelings and uh, you can notice that. Hmm. But if you don't identify with them and you're able to stay with that mix, gradually it becomes clear. Otherwise, if it's in a group of several people and there's a conductor aware of what's going on for quite, for quite a while, then the, the identifications between group members, the cross-identifications, appear so complex that you can almost it's very difficult to resist with the group conductor to kind of try and put some order into it and be given interpretation. Otherwise, you, your fear is it may go out of control. What's really interesting when you notice uh, when you when someone who you see someone who's really very experienced who who doesn't get drawn into that, and basically a lot of this is really not being afraid. Actually, not being drawn in to agree or defend or the strange thing that seems to emerge is that the group picks up on the stillness of the conductor not being drawn in 
And just like in a meditation group, then something is freer to come out. It's not so controlled by by the kind of habitual cognitive processes. That's my that's my understanding of it. I think there are different probably different uh, experiences that people have seeing this. But I guess the, the underlying similarity that's interesting, whether you're working in that field of psychoanalysis or psychiatry or other mental health situations, then meditation, is that there's a, a great similarity to realizing that the, the normal conventional view based on words and thinking and language is actually very, very limited. And that's when it becomes really interesting to see where this leads us, where the process goes. And a great leveler in you thinking about these different processes is because earlier on in these talks, people have mentioned the value of the developing the Brahma Viharas alongside meditation. And I think in both situations, certainly in, in psychoanalysis and working with groups, it's in group analytic work, the kind of realization that no matter what the disturbance is with individual members in the group, or in meditation terms, no matter what the different experiences of meditation are <coughs> between beginners and experienced meditators, there's a common denominator that we all basically are not all that different in, in terms of suffering. Basically, you know, we all have that experience of impermanence and suffering, birth and death. And that, I think, is a very important thread that allows us to hold our balance through this in a group. I know there's one or two people here who work in uh, mental health and um, I was thinking particularly of um, Charles, Charles King. When you're listening to this, Charles, I wonder whether you're thinking about the people on the, your COVID ward that you're talking about. What it is that holds them together when they're going through real fear. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's actually uh, what it was making me think about, which I was, is that actually because of all the social distancing and everything, all group processes are disturbed at the moment. So the way we come together as groups is really disturbed. And, and I was wondering what effect that's having along the lines of what you're saying. You know, the container is completely disturbed at the moment. Yeah. But you also have to your role is very interesting because you're not just a consultant psychologist on a forensic ward of women who mostly were infected by COVID. Yeah. You're also a meditator. And in that sense, you go into this mix of disturbance and you're holding a different position, you know, rather like the stillness in meditation. And I wonder how that is felt by the group quite different to a medical doctor yeah. who's explaining something about social distancing or, or risk or, and all that. Yeah. I, I would be amazed if it's not felt in the group. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. Yes, and people sometimes comment on it. Actually, often patients who are really, really, really unwell will make comments that kind of strike me that they've, they've noticed something about my 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 practice actually yeah. Yeah. yeah I was remembering a comment you made about two weeks ago I think it was what that Boonman said that um, that even after practicing for whatever 50 60 years that he was still fascinated by the breath and I was thinking that actually insofar as each breath is the quality of each breath is affected by the quality of the previous breath but also by the quality of everything that is happening at the moment when you're taking that breath 
then actually this the link between our breaths in all our you know in my working environment in my home environment mm. but also historically all the way back to the beginning in a way in our breath everything comes together it's in yeah. in each breath everything comes together um my work my family my relationships yeah. my history everything is in in some subtle way there in every breath so it's not surprising that the breath is fascinating yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yes um well i found the talk very interesting and i just had this question that um, it's a bit of a doubt about when the brain, you say when the brain, around the brain, it quietens down, does it mean that the brain waves go to like a theta level or a, you know, below alpha? And then does it, what is the difference? Is that like a light hypnotic trance? That's my question. When you, when the sensory consciousness goes or when there's a one pointed concentration, um, I just want to know, like, what's the difference between that and the, and and being in a trance state? Well, I'm never quite sure what people mean by by trance, but maybe maybe that might become a bit clear. But what that brings to mind is that when the first results came out of looking at meditators' brain activity then depending on experience and across a whole group of about 30 people, it was very difficult to make sense of actually what, what might represent a signature of the first, second, whatever jhana. But after two or three years, there were certain themes that come out across all the group of meditators. And those themes were very interesting. One of them was spindles, which I talked about in the first couple of talks. The spindles represent a disruption to, to attention. <coughs> then the second um, disrupt, then the second theme were very slow, and very powerful slow waves. And then the third theme were almost like instabilities Version on seizures. So the, the, all three of those are normally only seen in states of um, unconsciousness or partial consciousness, not full consciousness, like the spindles. Normally you see spindles on the edge of anesthesia or just before going into deep sleep. Someone's drowsy, their, their attention is very weak. They're not really clearly focused or aware of what's going on. The very powerful slow waves are normally only seen in actually deep, deep sleep where NREM, there's no activity, no rapid eye movement, and no dreaming, or in, as, in anesthesia, or coma, where people are, you know, are totally unresponsive and unconscious. And the, the, the kind of sort of semi-seizure related things relate or somewhat superficially and look similar to epilepsy, which is also an unconscious response. So here we've got a situation that on first sight, meditators appear to be going into the edges of unconsciousness. But what they're experiencing subjectively is being more vividly conscious, mm. not, not, did not kind of dissociated, like you, you might feel in a mild trance. But very clear, very, very clear sense of presence, but quite different to being aware of this or that. So it's certainly very different to unconsciousness. So a lot of the paper to be, that was published was just look at the similarities, and then look at the differences, which are very, very revealing as to what was going on in the brain. So this is quite new. I mean, it does not happen in any other pathological state. It doesn't happen in any other normal state. It happens in pathological states or states of unconsciousness. But this is happening in meditators where they're fully aware. So that's quite something to get your head around, really. Um, trance is a, is a kind of very confused word, really. Often it relates to the edge of, um, the edge of consciousness, 
you know, if you look at someone in their mild hypnotic trance, there's a lot of theta activity. And that's similar to being on the edge of drowsiness. All that goes in jhana meditation. All, everything goes. I mean, the alpha rhythm, which is about you know, 12 cycles a second goes, so what, what you're talking about, maybe the drowsy state, theta, is five, six, seven cycles a second. The cognitive processing beta, anything from 15 to 25 cycles a second, all those go. And you're left with this extremely slow, infra slow wave, which dominate, completely dominates the activity field. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. <laughs> um. No, uh, yeah, it does. It does in a way. Does that mean that the brain, because there's so little energy being used, the energy just gets pushed into the central vertex? Uh, it seems to. I mean, that's the conclusion that is the most obvious conclusion. Um, there's nothing to compare it with, really. That's the uh, intriguing difficulty. Um, on the whole balance of energy, the probably the the balance is that the, the overall energy may be not totally changed, as you say, it may be redirected into that vertical axis. But it's extremely difficult to measure the total energy and the whole activity, actually. I, I subjectively get the impression, looking at these recordings, that that's the case, that it's redirected. Okay. We're coming up to another threshold, 12.30, time for my cup of coffee. <laughs> so that's the end of these talks. Very happy that so many people seemed interested. Um, and I shall sign up. <laughs> Jatata pare sama tu pe kaput jangka Sante te zapata sina Tu nina sama tatika ta Awita pamuli jata Sangwat sante e kapin yaya Nidipanaya Oh, <laughs>